welcome to exhibition. And hello, Lisa Rochford. Good morning, Richard. Lovely to see you there, actually in the Rochford Gallery, uh, where your exhibition Savage Grace is being shown at the Rochford Gallery in North Sydney. And let's go to that title. Uh, first of all, Savage Grace actually sounds quite a quite an uncompromising title. Why, why did you choose that? Um, well, actually, to be perfectly honest about that, Anna Johnson, who um, is an extraordinary arts writer after viewing the collection of work um, coined that title. Uh, uh, but it was very befitting to uh, the nature of my work, which in some cases is a, is a parallel of opposites. It's, it sometimes has a much um, deeper or more graphic um, feeling than is obviously represented at the first glance. Certainly what we see in a, in a lot of the works um, in terms of your painting style is that use of very strong linear marks. Uh, you mentioned a, a graphic quality. Well, there's certainly very much the, the mark of the brush, the mark of the hand in your making of those strong linear marks. How did you come to, to develop that painting approach? Uh, I, I don't know that it was so much um, a development, but rather it's something that I've always naturally um, done in terms of a, in terms of a, um, I suppose, a scratching down or um, a quick way of mark making what is directly in front of me. And it's almost like a thatching or a, a stitching um, into the canvas, which is very similar to what you would feel when looking at an escarpment of millions of um, grasses and, and, you know, you quickly want to identify that energy. Uh, so I, I would suggest that that's probably uh, not necessarily something that I think of as a style, but rather the, um, a habit of mark. When you talk about uh, energy, I think you've also referred to those marks as raw fauvist brush strokes. Um, is that is that kind of fauvist feel something that you identify with strongly? Look, I think the fauvist movement is very interesting because it it was really um, in a time of incredible despair, global despair. Uh, and yet it had such incredible colour and energy. And it's, again, that parallel of opposites that um, I find most interesting. Colour has its own vibration, it has its own sense of smell. Um, and I think in many respects, you, when, when working um, in that particular style, you're, you're asking yourself, or you're constantly contemplating what's in front of you and how is it that you can translate the wholeness of how you're feeling? You know, the simple truth of it is, is that it's not a, it's not a pictorial um, undertaking of what's in front of you, it's a sensory undertaking. So it's what you're smelling, what you're feeling, what you're hearing, um, what you're bringing in that moment of time in front of you, which is actually, what the artist translates into their work. That sense of the of the total experience is one that is really only achieved when you are able truly to immerse yourself in the landscape or the environment uh, around you, to be able to have those sensory experiences that you've described. So for you, how important is the environment in which you live and work? Uh, because you, you live and work on a, on a property which is very much a country property, not a city-based location. It's a really interesting question because um, I have often been painting, and, and even though a lot of my works look like they may be studio-based, they're, they're not, they're, they're plein air painting. Uh, and quite often I'll start in the morning and, you know, an incredible uh, cloud formation or storm may be rolling in down the escarpment and 
without realizing it, I've started to paint the clouds into the into the work, or um, you know, the sun has changed and everything has become more more vibrant. So it, it is a, a big part of my work. Um, particularly with printmaking, there was a, a, a work in this exhibition called um, when the, Where the River Flows One and Two. And um, what was interesting about that is that that work took over a year to carve. But during that time, um, there was an, in, um, an incredible uh, shift in, in the water in the, in the river. And so you had this combination between natives and uh, exotic plants um, coming to head or seeding. And so all of a sudden, as, as that's happening, I'm starting to carve the seeds into the work, really not necessarily consciously, um, but a big part, I think, of, of being in the environment is that when I first went to rural Australia, I found that the, the escarpment was vast and a bit monotone. And the more I live there, the more I see really, really subtle colours, really fine colours. And you start to bring your depth of knowledge into the observation of that environment. Can we actually go to one or two specific examples from the exhibition to, to try to put some of these, these concepts and feelings, particularly about your relationship with the natural world uh, into visual reality. Um, let's start with uh, a, a work called Christmas Flowering Gum. And I wanted to start with that in a sense because it's something where you have commented about your perception of pattern in nature and the fact that, that you see pattern almost as a code in the natural context. Can you, can you explain a little how, uh, how you do see that and how that is perhaps reflected in this and other works? It's really, um, it's really about trying to understand, um, really, really understanding what nature is. And when we look at patterns, it's, it's really about where something evolves and where something is moving to. So it's the cycle of it in itself. So Christmas flowering gum is very much the observation of a very old tree that I have on the riverbank. And I don't know how it puts out this burst of blossoms every year, but it manages to. And every year I look and I think, are you going to be able to do it again? And it, and it just keeps giving. And, and that particular sentiment um, has very much a childhood memory for me in that probably one of the earliest experiences of picking up glass baubles and decorating a Christmas tree and not really being able to focus exactly on the piece itself, but rather the the abundance of light and energy that was coming from it. Whether that is metaphorical or whether that is a culmination of a childhood experience and then looking at nature and looking at this blossom. Um, I, think, I think in many ways they're, they're entwined and patterns, if you, if you look in detail or you're trying to hone in on, it, on an experience of something, how do you express the smell of honey that comes from that gum as it's expiring at the end of the day? And is it gelato or is it orange? Does it have heat? Um, there's all those really gorgeous, childlike, sumptuous qualities. Uh, and, and I suppose when you're painting, what you're trying to do is interact with that language of the tree as you're doing it. In quite a lot of what you described, there is also uh, an, an element of, of symbolism in the way in which you um, have presented these aspects of the structure of the, of the natural world. Uh, but there are strong elements of symbolism in, in a number of your works. And in fact, in the work which we can uh, see behind you called Never Say Goodbye, uh, there's a lot of symbolic representation, it would seem, of, of horses and 
humans and indeed a, a, a superb kangaroo. Can you give us a, a little bit of a, of a sense of how you use that symbolism and what you're saying in a work like that? So from, from a very young age, I had a great respect for um, dreaming and, and I probably valued the, um, the sleep state equal to the wake state for, to simplify it. And uh, in many respects, um, I, I think that sometimes we're, we're dreaming whilst awake and we're awake whilst asleep. And we have a, in a Western way, we have an idea that, that we like to put full stops in things. Whereas I say, it's all a continuum. And, uh, and so it's not, it doesn't surprise me that symbols evolve out of dreams. And in many respects, the painting behind me, I can honestly tell you that I, I didn't take to it with the idea that those characters would, would arrive. And sometimes when painting, I look at it at the end of the day, or maybe even a couple of weeks later and think, oh, I didn't realize there was a, a horse or a kangaroo there. And, and it's, it's really, it's almost as though I'm painting in a sleep state. Uh, and the painting Never Say Goodbye is really about a lot of conversations um, that I've had. And it's really, uh, it's, it's sort of a, it's a bit of a memory work for me. Not, not at the time did I understand that. It was sometime later after painting it that I said, what is this about? In fact, most of the time, a long time afterwards, I say, what's this painting about? As you reflect now uh, on another painting, um, Friendship Garden, what do you say that's about? Again, it seems to be full of what could be interpreted as, as symbolic elements, but what do you offer us? So Friendship Garden is really, um, there was, a, there was a, a sense when, you, when you're on a property, you can hear and feel things over time that can't always be explained. And there is no question that at certain times I've felt the presence of other things. And, but it's a nice feeling. It's a really lovely spiritual feeling. So whether that has been um, from our indigenous culture, whether that be uh, from earlier settlements of that place, it, or simply a spirit world. There's a lot of things that you certainly feel. And I thought, well, you know, it always arrives in my garden at some point when I'm painting. Uh, so, so Friendship Garden was really about allowing um, the space for otherness to be. You have mentioned uh, your property, um, your country property, which is uh, a working property. Uh, and I want to go to two works now, which perhaps touch on that property in different ways. Uh, Making Hay is the first work, and then Rainy Days uh, is the second. And with Making Hay, first of all, I want to go back to that conversation about the, the linear brushstrokes, because they, they are there and they really do seem to bring a, a tremendous sense of movement to the ground and indeed through to the sky. Uh, can you talk us through a little of that work? So Making Hay, that painting was, that was to document what was happening right in front of me because I thought at some point, I really always want to remember how hard it is to make hay. Um, you're always um, working against nature uh, you've got very short windows to cut the hay, uh, to allow it to dry, to bale it. And whenever you see storm clouds, that's trouble. That's a lot of trouble because you need to get that off very, very quickly um, before the rain. And so making hay, I, I thought, you know, anybody who has ever tried to make hay will look at that painting and think, I don't know whether I want to remember it or not, but... Uh, Again, it's, it's very much about, um, well, baling is stitching. Baling is stitching uh, or, or compounding um, hay together. So I suppose it's, uh, it, it's more of a study uh, in terms of a painting. And the painting, yeah. Rainy Days, um, 
uh, seems very much a different aspect of uh, life on the property because you do have a, a very close relationship yourself with kangaroos, don't you? I do, I do. They're sort of a little bit like my children. Unfortunately, um, we know very little about how to rear our native wildlife. There's not a great deal of study that goes into it. And uh, we have wires and, and carers uh, throughout regional Australia. But unfortunately, during the drought, um, there, there were very few carers and uh, most of the animals were euthanized. And I took on uh, a couple of kangaroos, which otherwise would have been, um, you know, euthanized. And one of them was Louis. And uh, he is an incredible, um, affectionate Eastern Grey. He's a big boy now, but um, he's decided that we are his mob. So we live very much um, in synchronicity with what happens around us. Let's take a, a jump sideways uh, into the area of woodblock prints. We've talked about some of the, the paint marks that uh, you uh, have utilised in your paintings, but there seems to be such a different flow of mark in your woodblock prints. Can you explain that? It is a different process because you have to be partly free but partly conscious at the same time because what you carve, you can't put back. And if you're, if you're toward the end of a work, end of a carving, you're very mindful um, about that balance and the time that you've spent carving. And I suppose uh, they're single marks, they're linear marks. And when carving um, either woodblock or lino, what I tend to find is that I'll get a general gist of where I want to go with it. And then whatever is happening on that day starts to be part of that process. So again, I carve outside on large tables um, and I allow the sun to, to warm the tools uh, and, and the, the block. And sometimes you have to work with, with pace and at other times you will just think about it and, and reflect over a month or two because you can't resolve. Now, also keeping in mind when you're carving, you're carving in reverse. Um, and you're creating your depth of field from larger marks to finer marks. In the exhibition, there are quite a number of ceramic works, and it seems in, in some ways that those ceramic works combine elements of your, of your woodblock or lino carving techniques with your painting techniques. Does it feel as though there is a, a confluence of everything in those ceramic works? There is. Um, carving, carving into clay is beautiful. It's, it's like putty. It's very similar to a soft lino. Uh, and you've got to be a little bit careful not to carve too deep. Uh, but ceramics, ceramics has a different feeling in that it has a void. So I'm very conscious of it's a vessel and there's, there's a space or a breath inside the work. So you tend to navigate around when, when carving um, the ceramics. So I tend to do a combination of things. I will start by carving or drafting or painting, um, but I'm not overly conscious. Again, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, and sometimes uh, I'll have it fired uh, once and then I'll go back and, and repaint but certainly uh, working three-dimensionally around the form is quite an exciting process. Let's conclude, if we can, with a final painting, Tinkering on Rising Light. Um, and there is a tremendous sense of vibration and movement and energy in this work. Would it be too much to say that it, it, it's almost a transcendent, possibly even sort of psychedelic sense of heightened reality or perception? I was looking at grasses and just prior to the light rising early morning, 
something would happen and and I one morning I thought I've, I've just got to sit up early enough and capture it and I again that was a plein air painting and uh, and what it was was that as the sun was rising the grasses that had a slight frost on them started to tinker and it's got to be very very quiet to hear it but when it's on mass it's like it's literally like a boat tinkering and and a crackling and and what it is it's it's the energy of the earth awakening and to be part of that i thought i, I really need to capture um for want of a better word the space between every element of grass and how do i do that how do i how do i without I don't want to use a palette knife. I don't want to use a broad brush stroke. I've got to somehow really capture how every plane of grass has is a living energy and it has a root system. And as the sun's rising, it's it's waking up um, and it's expiring its energy. And so that's really what tinkering on rising light was about. Well, as we share that extraordinary moment for you at the beginning of the day and the beginning of that painting. Thank you very much for sharing your exhibition with us today, Lisa Rochford. Thank you. Thank you, Richard.